In the last four installments of this video series, we studied the non-delegation doctrine. In the Whitman case, the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed two ideas. One, Article I forbids Congress to delegate legislative power. And two, Article I authorizes Congress to delegate decision-making authority, but only if the statute contains an intelligible principle. If a statute contains an intelligible principle, the statute may authorize federal agencies to exercise powers which, if exercised directly by Congress itself, would be legislative. Whitman also endorsed the court's precedents that allow broad and often vague language to count as stating an intelligible principle. Taken together, the court's non-delegation doctrine decisions permit Congress to confer significant legal powers upon the administrative agencies. Once the, the agency creating genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, the things it can do are impressive indeed. Once the genie is out of the bottle, how can Congress rein it back in? That is our next topic. Congressional control of agency action. Congress creates administrative agencies it does so by successfully completing the cumbersome legislative process set out in Article I of the Constitution. How can Congress control the agencies it has created? We will see that the means at Congress's disposal are somewhat limited. Given these limits, Congress has to think twice before giving agencies further powers going forward. Justice White described the dilemma this way. Congress is faced with a Hobson's choice either to refrain from delegating the necessary authority, leaving itself with a hopeless task of writing laws with the requisite specificity to cover endless special circumstances across the entire policy landscape, or in the alternative to abdicate its lawmaking function to the executive branch and independent agencies. He added, to choose the former leaves major national problems unresolved, to opt for the latter risks unaccountable policy making by those not elected to fill that role. But in the early 20th century, Congress thought it had found a way out of this dilemma by inventing a certain type of device. Agencies and their powers are creatures of the legislative process, so a special means of controlling might be built into the legislation that accomplishes the agency's creation and empowerment. This is the thinking that led to the invention of the legislative veto. Congress took an expansive view of the Constitution as an invitation to Congress to tinker. NYU law professor Jeremy Waldron asked us to see the Constitution as a machine with weights, springs, ratchets, escapements, and centrifugal governors. The Enlightenment constitutionalists, that is the founders, were the engineers and scientists of this machinery. They thought of themselves as experimenters, as in Madison's observations about the experiment of an extended republic. The framers thought of themselves as experimenters, so why shouldn't Congress, as the people's delegates, do so as well? Of course, one person's experiment can appear to another as an insidious encroachment on liberty, and still others might think that the Constitution the framers made allows no tinkering. These clashing views of the Constitution are evident in the Chata case. Chada tells us a lot about the means available to Congress to control what the executive branch and the independent agencies do with the powers Congress originally gives them. Mr. Chada came to the U.S. from Kenya on a British passport. He had a visa, but it expired. He stayed anyway to be with his family, who were citizens or permanent residents. Chada appeared in an INS deportation hearing and conceded that he was legally deportable but he petitioned for a state of the deportation proceedings to allow him to take advantage of a provision of the governing statute. The Attorney General had authority under the statute to suspend deportation proceedings against any deportable alien who could show three things. One, continuous residence in the U.S. for the seven prior years. Two, good moral character. And three, the deportation would cause extreme hardship to the alien or close family legally resident in the U.S. Had the Attorney General not made findings favorable to Chada, he would have had a right to judicial review. But in this case, it was unnecessary. The Attorney General made the findings, suspended the deportation proceedings, and, as required under the statute, 
reported to Congress. The statute, the Immigration and Nationality Act, Section 244, provided that if either the Senate or the House of Representatives passes a resolution stating that it does not favor the suspension of such deportation, the Attorney General shall, shall thereupon deport such alien. If within the time above specified, neither the Senate nor the House of Representatives shall pass such a resolution, the Attorney General shall cancel deportation proceedings. We don't know why, but a California congressman introduced a resolution of disapproval at almost the last possible moment. The congressman objected that he did not think that Chata's deportation and five other, other cases out of the 340 the Attorney General had reported would meet the statutory standard of extreme hardship. The resolution of disapproval passed, and Chata was ordered to depart these United States. Chata appealed within the INS, arguing that the legislative veto was unconstitutional. The INS denied his appeal on the ground that it had no authority to declare that the statute under which it operated was unconstitutional. Chata appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Attorney General appeal ap appeared, but took Chata's side against the constitutionality of that provision of the statute that allowed the one-house veto. Why would the Attorney General do that? Presumably, it was the hydraulic pressure that builds up inside any official whose power is challenged. But that same kind of hydraulic pressure prompted the House and Senate to ask to appear amici curiae, as friends of the court, to defend their power to exercise their legislative vetoes. The Ninth Circuit ruled for Chada and the case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Chief Justice Berger wrote the opinion for the court. He made it very clear that he was in no mood to approve tinkering. He wrote, we need not challenge the proposition that the One House veto was a useful political invention, but even useful political inventions are subject to the demands of the Constitution. In the court's opinion, the legislative veto provision of the statute violated the presentment and bicameralism clauses of Article I. Classifying the resolution of disapproval as, legislative, as a legislative act was decisive on the court's analysis because whenever the Congress does anything legislated, it has to comply with the presentment and bicameralism clauses of Article I, which, of course, the House did not do in passing the resolution of disapproval. The Senate did not concur, and the President had no chance to sign. The Court's opinion is not clear about this, but it does not strike down the statute of, on separation of powers grounds. How could it? This wasn't a case of Congress giving massive legislative power to the executive, as in Schechter Poultry, nor was it a case of Congress aggrandizing itself at the expense of another branch. Which branch would that be? The executive branch has no inherent authority over the admission of aliens. Justice Powell, in concurrence, contended that the resolution of disapproval usurped a judicial function, but the court majority and Justice White disagreed. Justice White wishes the majority had confined itself to a separation of powers analysis. For one thing, the result would not have been as sweeping, and just this. The court effectively struck down more statutes in Chada than it had cumulatively had held unconstitutional in the prior 200 years. All legislative vetoes, even two House vetoes, failed to comply with the presentment clause. When Congress legislates, it must comply with both bicameralism and presentment. Our bottom line is that after Chata, the agency genies that Congress lets out of the bottle are beyond its control by the device of the legislative veto. Congress, is, has, Congress has power under Article I to create and to dissolve agencies, but it cannot use the device of a legislative veto. After an initial panic to Chata, reaction to Chata, Congress got busy and passed the Contract with America Advancement Act of 1996, which President Clinton signed. Bicameralism and presentment. The act provides major rules not, are not effective until Congress has time to disapprove them, not less than 60 days. Expedited procedures are adopted in each house for joint resolutions of disapproval. Resolutions of disapproval must be presented to the president, who may veto. Agencies are barred from promulgating substantially the same regulations as ones 
disapproved. And there are certain exceptions for the Federal Reserve and for rules the President certifies to be necessary. The casebook notes that the mechanism was used to undo the OSHA ergonomics rule promulgated during the waning days of President Clinton's second term. Since the casebook's seventh edition came out, the Trump administration's Republican majorities in Congress undid a slew of agency rules promulgated late in President Obama's second term. For us, the takeaway is that Congress can control agencies by legislation, only by bicameral passage and presentment. While, of course, Congress can delegate authority to agents to do things which, if done by Congress itself, would be legislation. There are other legislative controls. Each year, Congress has to pass an omnibus spending bill, actually several bills, to fund the entire federal establishment. Congress can attach riders that defund certain agency actions, such as the enforcement of regulations Congress would veto if it could. But the nature of the funding process does not make this easy. Shut down anyone? And courts will not readily imply a repeal or amendment from a failure to fund. Repeals by implication are disfavored, is the byword. This means that an agency that was paralyzed under an outgoing administration whether for Congress's failure to fund it or the President's refusal to staff it, will still be there for an incoming administration to resuscitate if it wishes. Finally, both houses have oversight committees and subcommittees that can require agency officials to report and even to give testimony under oath. Verbal tongue lashings make great video. Possibly, some executive and agency officials have felt nostalgic for the good old days of the legislative veto.